This video is the first in a series which will cover the history of Christianity from Pentecost all the way through to today. Each installment in this series will cover approximately one century and will consist of two videos, one featuring a narrative of the persons and events of that century and the other featuring selected quotes from literature either from or pertaining to that century. In addition, each video will feature a bibliography including both writings from that period and his historical and scholarly works about that period. That bibliography can be found in the information table beneath the video on its YouTube page as well as on my blog. In this video we'll be taking a look at the Apostolic Church, that is the history of the church from Pentecost until the death of the Apostle John in about the year 100. Fifty days after the resurrection of Christ and ten days after he had ascended into heaven on the day of the Jewish festival of Pentecost in about the year 29, as Christ's followers were gathered together in prayer, the Holy Spirit descended upon them, appearing as tongues of fire. The apostles began to speak, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews who had gathered from all over the world to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. And each of the Jews present at the festival, no matter what his native language was, miraculously heard the apostles speaking in his own language. That day 3,000 people were baptized and the history of the Christian church began. Because of this event and others that followed it, the Sanhedrin, the council of Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, began to recognize that in spite of the execution of its leaders, the followers of this messianic movement were continuing their preaching and work, and the movement was quickly growing in numbers. They soon began an active and brutal persecution of Christians, which would last for many years. The first martyr of this persecution, in fact the first martyr of the new Christian faith, was St. Stephen the Proto-Martyr, a Christian deacon. He was accused of blasphemy against Moses and God and stoned to death. While being killed in this way, St. Stephen experienced a vision of God and asked him to forgive his murderers. After the martyrdom of Stephen, the apostles and other followers of Christ began to spread out from Judea, and by the end of the century brought the gospel to nearly every part of the then known world. The apostles Jude and Bartholomew, as well as St. Mary Amne, the sister of the apostle Philip, traveled to Armenia to preach the gospel. Thomas went to India. Matthew, the same who wrote the gospel of Matthew contained in our New Testament, went to Ethiopia. Andrew traveled throughout Asia Minor and as far north as Kiev in the modern day Ukraine. The Apostle John stayed with the Virgin Mary in Jerusalem, caring for her until her death in AD 40. He then traveled to Ephesus in Asia Minor to preach the gospel. In about the year 35, one of the men who had been present at the death of St. Stephen and who was a prominent persecutor of the church had a vision of the risen Christ while traveling on the road to Damascus, Syria. Because of this vision, this man converted to Christianity and later became one of its most influential and important founding figures. This man was Saul of Tarsus, a Jewish scholar and member of the sect of the Pharisees. He would be known to later generations as St. Paul the Apostle. St. Paul wrote 14 of the 27 books that make up our New Testament. That's more than half. He can also be credited with inspiring another book, the Gospel of St. Luke, which was written by Luke based upon what he had learned from Paul during their travels together. Beginning in about A.D. 44, he also went on three journeys proclaiming the Gospel all over Asia Minor, Greece, and later the city of Rome. He would eventually be martyred there in the year 67 alongside the Apostle Peter. St. Peter had come to Rome after founding the church at Antioch and appointing a bishop there. Arriving in Rome, he preached especially to the large Jewish population of the city. When St. Paul joined him in Rome, St. Paul began to preach to the Gentiles there. In July of A.D. 64, there was a large fire that spread over and consumed a large portion of the city of Rome. The Emperor Nero blamed the Christians of the city for the fire, though some historians of that period say that Nero himself probably started of the blaze. As a result, Nero began the first official persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. It was in this persecution that Saints Peter and Paul were martyred in AD 67. Peter was crucified. He insisted that his crucifixion be upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same way as the Lord.
St. Mark, who had accompanied St. Peter for much of his ministry and was a spiritual child of St. Peter, wrote his gospel based upon what he had learned from Peter about the life of Christ. Shortly before his death, Peter commissioned Mark to travel to Alexandria, Egypt and found a church there. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was spared the suffering of a death by crucifixion and beheaded. Trouble also struck the Christians in Jerusalem at about the same time. Although Christianity was now spreading far and wide in Europe, Africa, and Asia, and in spite of the persecution of Christians there at the hands of Jews, including the death by stoning of Jerusalem's first bishop and Christ's elder stepbrother James the Righteous in the year 62, Jerusalem, as the holy city of the Jews and the place of Christ's physical sojourn, remained the heart and center of the Christian church. When there were important issues issues to handle and decisions to be made, it was to Jerusalem that all of the followers of Christ, including the apostles, turned. For instance, when a dispute arose between the followers of Christ as to whether Gentile converts had to observe Mosaic law, it was to Jerusalem that the apostles and others gathered to discuss the issues and reach a consensus, holding the apostolic council there in AD 51. In AD 66, though, the Jews rose up in rebellion against the Roman Empire. Nero quickly dispatched an army to put down the insurrection. The Christians of the city, led now by their bishop, St. Simeon, a cousin of Christ, remembered Christ's prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem and fled the city. In the year 70, Christ's prophecies were fulfilled when the city of Jerusalem was retaken by the Romans and the temple was destroyed. The Jewish historian Josephus records that a million Jews were slaughtered by the Romans when the city was captured. By the 80s and 90s, all of the apostles except for John, and nearly all of the first generation of Christians, those who had known Christ during his earthly ministry, had passed away, whether through old age, sickness, or in many cases, martyrdom. The apostles, though, had foreseen that this situation would certainly arise one day, and had entrusted each church which they founded to the care of a bishop and priests. As the first generation of Christians passed away, these bishops and priests began to take charge of the church, guiding and leading it. It was also at this time that the first heresies began to arise, as there were less and less people who had seen Christ for themselves to correct those with false teachings. These wolves in sheep's clothing began to step out of the shadows and mislead some of the flock established by the apostles. There were two major currents of early heresy, the Ebionites and the Docetics. The first group, the Ebionites, were originally members of the party in the controversy leading up to the Apostolic Council who had wanted Gentiles who were converting to Christianity to have to observe the Mosaic Law. They chose not to obey the Apostolic Council and continued to teach their errors. After the passing of the Apostles, they broke even more with the rest of the Church and began to claim that Christ was the Messiah only for the Jews and not for the Gentiles. They also came to reject the divinity of Christ and to teach that He was only a human, though still the Messiah. The other group, the Docetics, took the opposite extreme, basing their false teachings on a misunderstanding of some of the words of St. Paul, they came to deny the humanity of Christ and to say that he only appeared human but was really divine. This group would later be assumed into the Gnostic groups which arose in the second century. It was in contradiction to these groups and to other errors of faith and practice that began to arise at the close of the apostolic era that the rightful heirs of the apostles, the bishops and priests appointed by them, began to assert their authority and take the lead in the life of the church. Perhaps the earliest example of this is the letter written by St. Clement as Bishop of Rome to the Christian community at Corinth. Because the Corinthian church had been established by St. Paul, when issues arose in their church over the dismissal of one of their priests, they turned for advice to Clement, a bishop who had been a disciple of St. Paul and had been appointed by Saints Peter and Paul to take charge in Rome. In the letter he wrote as a response to them, he gave a powerful testimony to the apostolic faith and admonished them to be obedient to their priests and not unlawfully dismiss them as they had done. Meanwhile, the longest living apostle in the 
only one not to be martyred, John, was living out his later years on the coast of Asia Minor. During this time, he battled against the proto-heresies of Ebionism and Docetism, and also became the teacher of several men who would take on very important roles in the church of the early 2nd century, including St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Polycarp of Smyrna. He also wrote a gospel, three letters, and the Apocalypse, all of which are contained in our New Testament. He died in about the year 100, and the Christian church, still young but already quite experienced, was left for the first time without an apostle. The opening of the second century found the nascent Christian church in its most challenging situation yet. Not only were Christians continuing to be persecuted by Jews, but now, due to the policies of the Roman Emperor Trajan, they were also being actively persecuted by the pagans as well. Compounding the problems the church was facing, the last living apostle, John, had passed away at the close of the first century, leaving the church without a living witness of Christ, and opening the floodgates for a variety of movements and sects, each claiming to be the true Christianity. These groups first began to creep out of the shadows near the end of the first century, and by the middle of the second century they were openly teaching their false doctrines. The bishops of the Christian church, appointed heirs of the apostles, were quick and strong in their response, rescuing the Christian faith from both destruction at the hands of Jews and pagans, as well as distortion at the hands of heretics. A few of the most important of these early bishops were Saints Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, and Papias of Herapolis, who had together been students of the Apostle John. St. Ignatius of Antioch was appointed, probably by the Apostle Peter, to be the Bishop of Antioch sometime in the second half of the first century. In AD 107, as Trajan was returning from a military victory in the east, he visited Syria in order that all citizens partake in sacrifices of thanksgiving to the pagan gods for his victory. Ignatius, as bishop of the area, openly refused to do so. As a consequence, he was arrested and taken to Rome, where the following year he was martyred by being eaten by lions in the Colosseum. While on his way to Rome, he wrote seven letters to various churches and to his friend Polycarp. All seven of these letters survive to us today, bearing a moving witness to the faith and zeal of this apostolic father. Ignatius' friend and fellow disciple of John, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, was appointed by John as Bishop of Smyrna. He once famously called the heretic Marcin of Sinope, the firstborn of Satan, to his face. He also was eventually martyred, bravely facing death for his faith in Christ in the year 155 at the age of 86. Only one of St. Polycarp's writings survives today, a letter he wrote to the Church of the Philippians shortly after the death of Ignatius. St. Papias of Herapolis was appointed by the Apostle John as Bishop of Herapolis. Unfortunately, not many of his writings survive to us today, but what we are blessed to have is very interesting. In his writings, Papias recorded and interpreted a variety of the sayings and actions of Christ as they had been reported by the Apostle John and others. Some of the sayings he records are not found in the four Gospels in our New Testament. As this great generation of men who had known and been disciples of apostles passed away, three heretical groups in particular gained momentum with their claim to be the real Christianity. All three groups claimed that the disciples of the apostles, or even the apostles themselves, had misunderstood Christ's teachings, and they said they were there either to restore or introduce the true Christian faith. The first of these groups, the Marcionites, was founded by Marcion of Sinope, the same one whom Polycarp had called the firstborn of Satan. He founded his organization in about A.D. 145. Marcion was born in about the year 85, the son of a Christian bishop in Sinope. In about 142, he moved to Rome, wooing the Christians there with a large donation to the church. He began teaching there that Paul was the only apostle who had really understood Christ's message, and, not ironically, that Marcion was the only one who really understood Paul. He taught that the God of the Jews was evil, and the Father of Christ was another all-good God who had sent his Son to rescue people from the evil Jewish God. 
He accepted only ten of Paul's letters and the Gospel of Luke as scripture, editing even these to exclude any reference to the Father of Christ being the same as the God of the Jews. He attempted to rid Christianity of anything that he saw as a Jewish element. As a result, he was excommunicated by the Bishop of Rome and set up his own rival Christian church, making himself the bishop. The second major heretical group of the second century, the Gnostics, had some similarities with Marcion, such as their rejection of the Jewish God, but also some very different beliefs. The Gnostics attempted to combine elements from other religions and philosophies, especially Platonism, with Christianity. They taught that because of a fall in heaven, various sparks of divinity had become trapped in the material world. These sparks were the souls of the elect who would return to heaven after their physical death. They claimed that Christ had come to pass on secret knowledge to these elect who were predestined for salvation. The Gnostics actually consisted of a variety of rival groups, such as the Carpocratians, the Valentinians, and the Cerinthians, with a variety of different beliefs. But these beliefs in particular seem to have been the common foundational beliefs they all shared. The other major heretical group of the second century were the Montanists. This group was founded by a man named Montanus who traveled the Roman Empire with two women whom he called prophetesses. He claimed that his teachings were a new revelation of God and that he and his followers were able to have the Holy Spirit speak guidance for the church through them, leading he and his followers to reject the authority of the bishops and set themselves up as leaders of the Christian church. They even went as far as to claim that their new prophecy superseded the teachings of the apostles. He and his followers were also rigorous who denied that a person could repent of sins committed after baptism. For these and other errors they were excommunicated from the Christian church. As a response to these groups and to the accusations of pagans and Jews who claimed amongst other things that Christians practiced cannibalism and sought to overthrow the Roman Empire, the second half of the second century also saw the rise of a class of Christian authors called the Apologists. By far the greatest of these were Tertullian of Carthage and Saints Justin the Philosopher and Arrhenius of Lyons. Tertullian of Carthage was the first Christian author to write in Latin, the language that would later come to dominate Western European Christian writings. He was a lawyer and used his training in rhetoric, logic, and law to write eloquent and forceful defenses of Orthodox Christianity and to show the weakness of the systems and arguments used by heretics and pagans. Unfortunately, due to his rigorous tendencies, he later, in the early 3rd century, fell away from the church and joined the sect of the Montanists. St. Justin the Philosopher, often called Justin Martyr, was born in about 100 in Palestine to a Samaritan mother and a Greek father. After dabbling in various pagan philosophies, he eventually converted to Christianity, saying that he had finally found the true philosophy. He wrote several apologetic works against the pagans and the Jews, and also became a lay teacher of Christianity in Rome. He was eventually, in about AD 165, martyred there after defeating a pagan in a debate. St. Arrhenius of Lyons had been a disciple of St. Polycarp of Smyrna. Later, he became bishop of the city of Lyons in modern-day France. While bishop there, he thoroughly investigated the various Gnostic groups by reading their writings and interviewing former members of their sects. Based upon his research, he wrote a great five-volume refutation of these groups called Against Heresies, countering their claims and expounding the true faith. He also was eventually martyred. Irenaeus was also a major founding figure in the movement that began at this time to formulate and canonize the books which would later make up what we today call the New Testament. This process was largely initiated as a reaction to various forgeries being produced by the Gnostic heretics. In order to protect Christians from false beliefs, the bishops began sorting the authentically apostolic writings from later forged documents. In doing so, they largely used four criteria, ancientness, apostolicity, catholicity, and orthodoxy. In order to be considered authentic, a given writing had to be of a verifiable first century origin, had to agree with the other authentic writings of the apostles, had to have a history of wide use in the church, and had to agree with the apostolic faith as it had been passed down from Christian to Christian in the years since the apostles.
It was this faith which the majority of Christians, few of whom were famous authors or bishops, continued to faithfully and quietly live each day, praying for themselves, the church, and on behalf of the whole world, teaching others of the hope of eternal life in Christ, rendering loving service and charity to all, and gathering each Sunday in homes and in churches to participate in a communal liturgical prayers and to partake of the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist. They did this even as they endured slander, hatred, and persecution from their non-Christian neighbors. Those of them who suffered and died for the faith were especially honored by the Christian community, earning the title of martyr. The remains of the martyrs, called relics, were kept as hidden treasures and venerated in homage to the martyrs. The martyrs were also called upon in prayer to intercede before the throne of God on behalf of those still on earth. Near the end of the second century, in about A.D. 190, in Alexandria, Egypt, St. Pantanus, after traveling as a missionary to India, founded the famous Catechetical School of Alexandria, whose early leaders, including St. Clement of Alexandria and Origen Adamantius, would be major influences, for better or worse, in later Christian thought. The third century opened on a high note for the Christian church. Although there were still heresies to fight against and pockets of persecution throughout the Roman Empire and elsewhere, the Christian church was largely at peace in and experiencing new levels of toleration and even acceptance by the non-Christian world around it. In fact, one Roman emperor, Philip the Arab, had such a favorable stance toward Christians that rumors circulated claiming that he himself was a Christian. The church was also experiencing unprecedented growth during this time, converting even high-ranking members of the Roman government and military, and building large churches across the landscapes of cities and countrysides all over the Roman world and beyond. This period of peace and toleration gave Christian intellectuals a new and unprecedented opportunity to try their minds and pens at biblical interpretation, philosophy, and answering hitherto unanswered and thus far largely unasked questions in Christian theology. More than a few of these Christian intellectuals used this opportunity to produce prodigious works of scholarship. Perhaps the most prominent of these intellectuals, and almost certainly the one who has had the largest and longest lasting impact was Origen Adamantius. Origen, the son of a Christian martyr, had been selected as the leader of the Catechetical School of Alexandria after the death of his teacher, St. Clement of Alexandria. During his life, he produced an amazing amount of texts on every subject of relevance to Christians of his day. It is said that a team of scribes followed him around wherever he went, and he would dictate to them as he went about his daily tasks, writing multiple books on different topics simultaneously. Perhaps his most monumental work was the Hexapla, a side-by-side, verse-by-verse comparison of six different versions of the Old Testament in both Greek and Hebrew. Brew. Unfortunately, Origen became a very controversial, if nonetheless influential, figure even during his own lifetime, and he is probably best known today for his theological errors, largely as a result of his allegorizing tendencies in Old Testament studies. He made far too many concessions to the Gnostics during the course of his disputes with them. He came to assert that human beings were originally made purely spiritual, and that the material world was a result of the fall. As a result of this scheme, he also came to the conclusion that all humans would eventually be restored to God, and none would be damned. For these and other errors, he would later be condemned by numerous church fathers and church councils, including, most famously, the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553. His influence persisted nonetheless, and he was a major influence especially on the fathers of the 4th century, who heavily borrowed from his methods and terminology, even while rejecting many of his ideas and conclusions. Unfortunately, the peace that produced scholars like Origen and afforded them the time to ponder questions like these wasn't to last. In 249, the Roman Emperor Decius ascended to the throne. He had never been friendly toward the church, always being conscientious about excluding Christians from his inner circle, but his possession of the imperial throne brought out the worst in him. The year following his accession, 250, he launched the first empire-wide persecution of Christians. 
DC has issued a decree that all people within the Roman Empire must offer a sacrifice and worship before the image of a pagan god. To ensure that his order was carried out, he dictated that each citizen would be issued a certificate after the completion of this act, and that those without this certificate would be punished. Hundreds of Christians gave up their lives in the persecution rather than offer sacrifice and worship to a pagan idol. Amongst the Christians who were martyred included many prominent figures, including Origen Adamantius, St. Cyprian, the famous church father and bishop of Carthage, and St. Fabian, the bishop of Rome. As a result of the general anti-Christian attitude that this new persecution engendered in the Roman populace, there were also anti-Christian riots in Carthage and Alexandria. Alexandria. In 260, the persecution was repealed by Decius's son, Gellianius. Although official empire-wide persecution was ended, relationships of pagans with Christians remained tense, often breaking out into acts of violence and occasional persecutions. In 284, a vehement anti-Christian, Diocletian, acceded to the Roman imperial throne. He removed all government officials and members of the military who professed faith in Christianity. At the beginning of the 4th century, he would launch the greatest persecution that the Christian church had ever endured up to that point in history. Although many Christians went willingly to martyrdom for their faith in Christ during these persecutions, there were also many who chose to save their lives by sacrificing to the pagan gods, thereby apostatizing from Christianity. Many of these people, called the lapsed, were later to repent of their apostasy and seek to rejoin the Christian church. As a result, a major dispute arose in the church over how readily these individuals should be re-received. Most of the church was understanding of the pressure that these individuals had faced and required only minimal penance before their official re-reception. Some in the church, however, especially the Christians of Africa who had been hit the hardest by the persecutions, opposed this lax policy and demanded much stricter requirements for re-reception. Some of these even went as far as to claim that apostates could never return to the Christian faith at all. As a result of these differences in opinion over the re-reception of the lapsed, the first major schism from the Christian church took place. Novatian, a priest in Rome, disputed with the bishop of Rome, St. Cornelius, on the matter, proclaiming that the lapsed could never be re-received into communion with the church, and that all heretics who came to the church had to be re-baptized and not just chrismated. Eventually, he set himself up as an alternative bishop of Rome and set up his own church in resistance, taking a large portion of the Roman Christians with him. The schismatic Novatianist sect was to continue for several centuries. Also during this time, the great tradition of Christian monasticism began to be established. Since the days of the apostles, there had been Christians throughout the church who had chosen to live in lifelong celibacy, dedicating themselves entirely to God and to the church, as well as those who had chosen to take vows similar to the Nazarite vows of the Old Testament. In the mid-third century, however, these special Christian devotions began to take on a new form and to more firmly establish themselves in the life of the church. The earliest known Christian hermit, though there was almost certainly others before him, is St. Paul the Hermit, who took up the life of a hermit in the Egyptian desert sometime in the middle of the third century. The most famous Christian hermit, though, who is generally known as the founder of Christian monasticism, is St. Anthony the Great. Upon hearing the words of Christ in Matthew 19:21, to sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come, follow me, Anthony did just that. He sold the entire inheritance which had been given to him by his rich parents, gave all the money to the poor, commended his younger sister into the care of a community of celibate Christian women, and went himself into the desert to battle the demons and to devote his life to Christ in prayer and fasting. Anthony spent most of his time in the desert living in a cave, constantly praying, fasting, and fighting the various demons who assaulted him through temptation and even physically. Eventually, many people began traveling to the desert to see this holy man for themselves and to speak with him. Many of them decided to stay there and imitate Anthony's way of life. By the end of the following century, men and women would flock to the Egyptian desert in droves to take up the monastic way of life.
All in all, the third century was the most difficult era that the Christian church had yet endured. While it had opened with great promise, as the Christian church experienced previously unknown levels of toleration and growth, it had, by mid-century, descended into terrible persecution, such as that under Decius, and seemingly irreparable schism, such as that of Novatian. Nonetheless, the Christian church persisted through each of these struggles, always coming out stronger in the end. In spite of the accession of the anti-Christian Diocletian to the Roman imperial throne, Christians had great prospects of a brighter future. But none expected the upheavals that were to come. As the church entered the 4th century, its 300th year of existence, it would experience both the greatest trials and the greatest triumphs in its entire history. Aside, of course, from the first century, the fourth century is almost certainly the most important century in Christian history, probably the most important century in Western history, and arguably the most important century in the history of the entire world. The monumental events of this century created great ripple effects that continue to have consequences today. The towering figures of the fourth century continue to be major shaping influences in Christian thought, and in the the Western mind and culture in general. It is because of the events and people of the 4th century that the world is as we know it today. Because of this, I've decided that I just can't fit all of these giants into a single video. In this video, I'll be covering the years 300 to 350, and in my next video, I'll cover the second half of the 4th century. The 4th century opened for the Christian Church on notes of both hope and defeat. In 301, because of the work of St. Gregory the Illuminator, the king of Armenia, Tiridates III, converted to Christianity and proclaimed it the official religion of Armenia, making Armenia the first officially Christian nation in the world. St. Tiridates would work tirelessly to spread the Christian faith amongst the people of his land until his death in 330. While the Christians of Armenia were celebrating this great victory, the situation for Christians in the Roman Empire had reached its worst state yet. On February 23rd of 303, the Emperor Diocletian issued the first in what would become a series of four progressively more violent edicts against the Christians. Diocletian's first edict ordered the destruction of Christian churches and the burning of scriptures and liturgical books, as well as a ban on Christian worship assemblies. Christians were also deprived of their right to petition Roman courts, and Christians in the Roman government and military were stripped of their ranks and titles. The second edict followed in the summer of 303, in which Diocletian ordered the arrest and imprisonment of all Christian clergy, including bishops, priests, as I mentioned in the last video of this series, the 4th century was certainly a century of giants for the Christian Church. In this video, we'll be taking a look not only at a few significant events that occurred in the second half of the 4th century, that is the years 350 to 400, but also in the course of looking over that history, we'll look at the life, work, and impact of some of these giants of Christianity. Perhaps the most important event of the second half of the 4th century was the life, short reign, and violent death of Julian, a nephew of St. Constantine the Great and the last pagan Roman emperor. Although he had been born and raised as a Christian, Julian secretly converted to paganism in 351. Because of his abandonment of Christianity in favor of the old gods, history remembers Julian as the apostate. Ten years after his secret conversion, Julian the Apostate became Emperor of Rome, largely through happenstance. St. Constantine's son and successor, Constantius II, appointed Julian as Caesar or Junior Emperor in 355, in order to allow Julian to lead an army against the barbarians in Gaul. In 360, Constantius II, no longer having need of Julian's services, attempted to remove Julian from this position. Julian's soldiers reacted by proclaiming Julian to be co-Augustus, or senior emperor, along with Constantius. Constantius died before he had time to react to this proclamation. In 361, Julian, now sole Roman emperor, publicly confessed his conversion to paganism.
Although he did not renew outright persecution of Christians, he enacted several laws meant to subtly undermine the Christian church, and was more than happy to look the other way or offer only light punishments when his fellow pagans did decide to exercise violence against Christians. He also attempted to reform paganism in order to make it more palatable to Romans, who had begun to embrace the Christian church.